This is episode 17 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 39, 3.1.2 Energy Generation Humans are ingenious, and we have developed many strategies for wresting power from nuclear fusion and fusion. All energy generation can be traced back to radioactive decay, whether it is the sun or unstable elements here on Earth. The most obvious and direct way we generate electricity from these reactions is through the use of nuclear power plants and photovoltaic cells. The next level of energy generation burns biomass that grew using solar radiation. This can be either ancient biomass that has been compressed into coal, gas, or oil, or the combustion of recent biomass in the case of wood stoves. The third level of energy generation comes from the consumption of biomass, either directly feeding an animal, such as an ox that pulls a plow, or burning the fermented and distilled byproducts of consumption, such as with corn, ethanol, and biogas. The final level comes from the atmospheric effects of solar radiation, namely the movement of wind and water over the land surface, which generates power from wind, tides, and dammed rivers. In some cases, we can see a right way to harness this power, but in many instances these resources are best left untapped because their side effects outweigh their benefits. On the first level, the direct use of nuclear reactions, we see two diametrically opposed systems, nuclear power plants and solar energy. Nuclear power is generated when fissionable material, usually uranium, is allowed to decompose into daughter elements. This produces heat that is transferred through a heat exchanger to water, which boils, creating steam. This steam passes through turbines that generate electricity. On the one hand, no carbon or other greenhouse gases are emitted through this process, which is the main positive characteristic of nuclear energy. On the other hand, nuclear generation is a centralized system, and when the plant goes down for maintenance, or other reasons, it causes widespread disruption. More importantly, even when running according to design, nuclear plants generate waste that has nowhere to go. Right now, the U.S. has well over 50,000 tons of nuclear waste waiting for a permanent repository. In addition, the chance, even though it is a small one, of a nuclear meltdown is too great a risk. The cost-benefit analysis of this energy source is decidedly in favor of shutting it down. Photovoltaic panels, on the other hand, generate power by converting solar radiation into electricity by taking advantage of the photovoltaic effect, which is essentially when light excites an electron to produce an electric charge. Of course, the manufacture, transportation, and installation of the photovoltaic panels under the current system is dependent on fossil fuels, but the one-time cost of their creation is outweighed by the long-term clean, decentralized energy generation. Solar arrays, which are large installations often placed in deserts, concentrate the sun's rays to a central point, creating steam and rotating turbines to create electricity like a conventional power plant. Although neither greenhouse gases nor radioactive waste are generated, these are complicated, centralized systems and may not be sustainable in the long run as a distributed grid of rooftop solar panels. Second level power generation comes from the combustion of ancient or modern biomass. It's clear that fossil fuels are a dirty business from start to finish. From an engineering point of view, fossil fuels are extremely efficient because they hold a great amount of energy in a concentrated substance, but let's start at the beginning. Whether it's an offshore oil platform, a coal strip mine, or fracking in Oklahoma, obtaining fossil fuels either destroys the local environment by design, just perform a Google image search for mountaintop removal or tar sands excavation site, or by accident, see also Deepwater Horizon, Oklahoma fracking earthquakes, and fracking methane leaks. In addition, we have to consider the waste products of extraction, be they proprietary, that means toxic, compounds used in fracking to the leachate from coal mining backfill. Fossil fuels must be refined, which requires complicated chemical reactions to be contained in huge facilities, as anyone who has driven through Houston will know. To release the energy stored in fossil fuels, we must burn them, putting tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. EPA, Coal puts out about 2.10 pounds of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Natural gas comes in at 1.22 pounds, and oil somewhere around 1.7 pounds. Note, US EPA 2016. End of note. If we take an average of 1.80 pounds per kilowatt hour for fossil fuels, which generate about 65% of the 3.8 trillion kilowatt hours used by the US each year, Note, fossil fuels account for about 65% of U.S. electrical generation. This percentage is broken up at 65% coal, 35% natural gas, and 1% petroleum. Therefore, fossil fuels average 
2.1 pounds per kilowatt hour times 0.65 plus 1.22 pounds per kilowatt hour times 0.34 plus 0.17 pounds kilowatt hours times 0.01 equals 1.80 pounds per kilowatt hour. End of note. We get 4.4 trillion pounds of CO2 emissions, or about 2 billion metric tons, about a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions globally. Each of us is responsible for about 38 pounds per day. Between each one of these steps, fossil fuels must be transported by pipelines, rail, truck, or ocean-going tanker. Each field has its own share of accidents. See also Kalamazoo River, Castleton, North Dakota, and Exxon Valdez, as well as the comprehensive list compiled by Riverkeeper. Note, Riverkeeper, 2016. End of note. We have repeatedly patched problems in the fossil fuel system instead of accepting the fact that it is fundamentally broken. We can draw an analogy to an old car. At what point are the repairs costing more than the vehicle is worth? The time has come to stop repairing the fossil fuel system and get a better model. Modern biomass is a more likely candidate for careful use in the future. Unlike fossil fuels, which are non-renewable, biomass is a constantly growing resource. This means it must be carefully managed, as we have seen what happens when societies overharvest forests for fuel, see also the ancient Maya and Romans. In most cases, biomass will decompose and release about two-thirds of its stored carbon back into the atmosphere after it dies, and therefore burning it only contributes a third more carbon than would have otherwise been released. This does not mean, however, that everybody can simply use wood stoves and virgin timber to heat their homes in the winter. Burning also contributes particulate matter to the local atmosphere, so high-efficiency stoves are needed and a careful source of fuel must be chosen and managed. With thoughtful building design, a minimal amount of heating would be necessary anyway. A superior alternative to biomass, though, is biogas, which will be discussed below. The third level of energy generation uses the consumption of biomass to create energy. Before the Industrial Revolution, animals were used to pull plows and carts as well as turn treadwheels. These animals converted their biomass energy into kinetic energy. Indeed, animals combined with ingenious engineering can achieve a high output of energy per calorie. A bicyclist burns about 50 calories per mile, about 3 kilocalories per pound per mile. This is comparable to a 35 mile per gallon car, which requires 900 calories, about 2.89 kilocalories per pound per mile, to do the same work. Note, this assumes a 155 pound bicyclist going one mile burns about 50 calories, whereas a 2,600 pound Honda Fit burns about 900 kilocalories in that same mile. Obviously, 900 kilocalories of gasoline, about 0.0286 gallons, is cheaper than 50 calories of food. End of note. In addition to fueling muscle power, biomass consumption also sustains life and is later converted into nutrient-rich compost. This type of energy generation is almost certainly sustainable in the long term, as it is impractical to create an engine that runs on too many horse treadmills, for example. Furthermore, traction animals can often eat fodder not suitable for humans, which helps dissipate our ecological footprint. The industrial world has harnessed biomass to create fossil fuel replacements. Unfortunately, turning corn, sugarcane, or switchgrass into ethanol to dilute gasoline is not sustainable. On the surface, we can look at how many energy units are needed to produce another unit of energy, or energy return on investment, also called EROI. Note, all data here from Hall et al.'s 2014 summary article. End of note. Coal, for example, is a concentrated and fairly easily obtained fuel, which returns up to 80 units of energy for each unit expended in its extraction. Ethanol from sugarcane might only return 10 units of energy for the same energy expenditure. Corn is much worse, returning only 1.6 units of energy. Raw eroy is a useful tool for analysts, but it only shows the comparison of energy. To get a more complete picture, we must analyze the eroy soch, that is, the societal eroy. Eroy Soch is nearly impossible to measure because of the complex and myriad variables that go into it. It is found by summing, quote, all gains from fossil fuels and all costs of obtaining them, end of quote. Note, Hall et al. 2014, 142 to 143, end of note. For example, along with terrible raw eroy, biofuels might be made of food crops, which raises the price of food. Biofuel crops are often over-fertilized and grown on marginal lands, which leads to nutrient-rich runoff and massive surface erosion. These indirect costs must be weighed against the minimal gains. One sustainable way that biomass can be converted into fuel is through the capture of otherwise wasted biomass. Although switchgrass and sugarcane have higher eroy values than other vegetation, they must be purposefully grown and harvested. Meanwhile, millions of tons of vegetation is dumped into the waste stream. The energy lost in decomposition might be better used by being converted into a flammable gas. Indeed, waste from animals, vegetation, and food preparation can all be turned into a fuel equivalent to natural gas. 
Even though the basic Eroy of biogas is modest at just 5 to 10, the Eroy Soche of this fuel must be judged highly since it sequesters methane from manure, which has less of an impact when combusted as biogas than when it is simply released into the atmosphere. Furthermore, the use of quote-unquote waste products reduces the cost of input material. A modest use of biogas for heating or cooking on an individual or community level might well be a viable strategy for our future. Solar radiation evaporates water and creates temperature differentials across the globe. This moves moisture and air over the Earth's surface, resulting in wind, precipitation, and rivers. Wind power has been used by humans for thousands of years, pushing boats, turning windmills, and powering modern wind turbines. Opponents of large wind turbines claim they kill birds and cause a low, constant, bothersome grumble. Cats and communication towers kill 6,000 to 10,000 times and 8 to 32 times more birds than wind turbines, respectively. And on a per gigawatt hour basis, wind turbines kill 10 times fewer birds than fossil fuel power plants. Note, Ericsson et al., 2014, Sovacool, 2013. End of note. Furthermore, wind turbine syndrome has been linked to self-inflicted psychological stress, not physiological triggers, and dismissed as a nocebo effect by the public health community. Note, Crichton et al., 2014. Nevertheless, large wind turbines may not be an ideal long-term solution as they require complex manufacturing and maintenance. Furthermore, they are centralized, and if a large turbine goes down, it would have wide-ranging effects. Although smaller wind turbines are less efficient, they are decentralized and can be built at home. Depending on where one lives, wind power might be a steadier alternative or partner with solar. We might also revert to using wind power as kinetic energy instead of electric generator. For example, a geothermal heating system typically relies on an electric pump to circulate water. However, a wind turbine could also perform that function. Once on the ground, precipitation heads downhill, forming rivulets, streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. The downward flow of water represents a huge amount of potential energy. Hydroelectric dams are the dominant way that industrial societies use flowing water to generate electricity. Damming a river is seen to provide not only power, but to regulate the seasonal ebb and flow of a river, averting spring floods and late summer droughts. Unfortunately, the unforeseen or underappreciated consequences of damming rivers now appears to outweigh the benefits. While the carbon-free energy generation is appreciated by the public, dams wreak havoc on regional ecological systems. Human-made lakes slow streams which deposit their sediment upstream. This has had adverse effects on deltas and estuaries that depended on a constant influx of sediment. The Nile and Mississippi deltas are receding, and in the case of the latter, reducing the protective buffer the wetlands offered against hurricanes. The discharge coming out of dams is from the bottom of the water column, and thus much colder than local systems have evolved to handle, causing problems for fish, plants, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Aquatic animals that depend on traversing the length of a river are forced to adapt or die when a dam is built. The annual flood was a regionally important event, but in an effort to protect human property, it has been stemmed. Instead of moderate annual floods, we now experience periodic extreme floods, which is especially damaging to people who have built-in locations made habitable only by the illusion of safety given by dams and dikes. Small-scale water power is a sustainable way forward. Unlike modern large dams, small water wheels are not a centralized power source. If made without dams, a small water wheel can convert flowing water into a modest amount of electricity or kinetic energy. Tile movements and waves can rock energy-generating buoys without significantly impacting the environment. If one is located near flowing water, skimming a little energy without impeding the river's course is a reasonable proposition. We would be remiss if we failed to mention the use of geothermal energy to heat and cool indoor spaces. Although not currently used to generate electricity or other forms of power, the relatively constant temperature of the Earth's crust can be harnessed in a low-power system to cycle cool water into hot summer homes and warm water to fight the winter chill. In addition to pipe-bound systems, houses could be built into hillsides or underground to take advantage of the Earth's thermal inertia directly. As noted above, building with energy use in mind, especially heating and cooling, is a prime way to decrease the amount of power we need to live comfortably. End of chapter. Chapter 40. Coal Plant Fired. Spring 2016. Brett Gooderson watched the train snake by. Each car carried almost 150 tons of coal. What do you think? he asked Natalia, whose eyes oscillated after each car. Brett was tall, his hair was going shaggy lately, and he wore a few days stubble. Natalia was shorter, with long black hair and focused intense eyes. Both were bundled against the damp chill of January in St. Louis. Natalia thought for a minute. We'd have to make a map of each power plant, find the track that services it, and an overpass where we can drop the charges in, she said. I looked it up and the U.S. has about 600 coal power plants, so there's no way we can get them all. Maybe we should start at the top of the list of the biggest emitters and move down. 
We'll just see how many we can get into the 50 days before the big week, he said. If we start with the big ones, it would be a clear message. But that's eight months away. We've got so much more time. Yeah, but coal companies only keep about two months' worth of coal on hand. So if we start seeding them now, they'll blow up too early, when the charges are burned with the rest of the coal. If we plan it out right, we could probably seed two plants per day. So the top 100 polluters. You know Labity's fourth worst in the nation, right? Natalie rolled her eyes. Yeah, I was in your class. What if we brought in another team or two in the final stages? We could do all the prep work and then have a few groups seeding plants across the country. We'd hit more targets, and if anyone's caught, the others could at least keep moving. Brett's eyes narrowed for a moment, just for a second, before he recovered himself. Shit, he thought. Now I have to convince her to forget that idea, because she can't know the full plan until the time comes. He looked away towards the click-clack of the cars. Well, we certainly could do that, but it would open us up to more exposure. Plus, it is risky bringing people in at the last minute. But we know people who would join us in a second. She was hurt that her idea wasn't better received. What about Josh and Eric? Oh, Eric would help for sure. This time his eyes didn't narrow and he cut her off more quickly than he could have liked. No, no, Eric is definitely out. He had planned an excuse for this already. I approached him the same way I did for you, but he didn't want to hear it. Natalia furrowed her brows. That's odd. He sounded pretty militant whenever he got worked up enough to say something in class. A paper tiger, I guess. Brett wondered how surprised she would be to learn about their mutual friend's role in the movement. Eric had been the one to suggest to Brett that he bring on Natalia in Prometheus. Brett thought the name was a bit melodramatic, but the Greek god who stole fire from Mount Olympus was a fitting namesake for the project that would permanently cripple the nation's coal-fired power plants. They hoped it wouldn't turn into the romantic interpretation of Prometheus, that is, causing harm with one's good intentions. He remembered the day when Eric broached the subject. It was months after they first had agreed to move forward with their project. Eric knew that some of Brett's family members had gotten asthma living downwind of the Labity plant. Eric had come in his office and shut the door. He asked out of the blue what Brett wanted to do about the coal plants. Brett asked if he meant in the current world, or, he paused, later. As Eric just smiled, Brett laid out the idea he had been thinking about since their hike. A coordinated sewing of explosives into open coal trains headed to power plants. The explosives would be made to look like typical pieces of coal, and would ride with the rest of the fuel from the storage area to bunkers in the plant. Once in the bunkers, the coal would be milled into fine powder. But when the grinding plates hit the charges, the explosives would go off, crippling the feed system of the plant. It would be small enough to shut it down, but not enough to hurt the operators. Brett, hearing his name, derailed his train of thought. Sorry, I was just trying to think of more people to join us. I've got a few ideas. For now, though, we need to get planning. I had an idea for that. Let me do a directed study with you this semester, and the topic will be the transportation network of coal. I'll be doing research and writing a paper on the topic, which will be good cover if any of the work is found. Heck, I could even get a tour of a coal plant. That's perfect. End of chapter. Chapter 41. Mining Problems. Summer, 2015. Headline. Toxic spill in Colorado worse than it first reported. Mining executives targeted by eco-terrorists. August 11, 2015. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Wired News Agency. Six days ago at the abandoned Gold King Mine near Silverton, Colorado, Environmental Protection Agency workers conducting an inspection accidentally released 3 million gallons of wastewater carrying arsenic, lead, and other toxic heavy metals into the Animas River, a tributary of the San Juan River system. This disaster has affected tens of thousands of residents of the Four Corners region and the Navajo Nation. Note, U.S. EPA, 2018. Pagel, 2015. Plummer, 2015. End of note. Sunnyside Gold Corporation owned and operated this and similar mines throughout the West. Although this mine had been shut down since 1923, Sunnyside continued to operate in the area until 1991, but claimed, along with other local stakeholders, to not have the estimated 12 to $15 million needed to clean the defunct mining sites. Sunnyside is now owned by Kinross Gold, the world's seventh largest gold company. For their part, local residents resisted the EPA's offer to name the area a Superfund site, which would have triggered massive federal spending to rehabilitate the area. Within two days of the disaster, Kinross Gold executives and board members received letters in the mail stating that they had won a Crime Against Nature award, and as a result, their neighborhood water mains had been contaminated with an equal proportion of arsenic, lead, and other heavy metals as were thought to have spilled into the Animus River. Dozens of five-gallon drums containing traces of concentrated arsenic, lead, and other toxins were found next to the water main accesses near three of the five publicly listed company executives and four of the five board members. Law enforcement agencies in each of the responsible jurisdictions are working with national and international investigators to attempt to identify the culprits. Some of these neighborhoods have been evacuated while municipal and federal officials work to clean the water supply. Headline, Mining Executives Subject of Terrorism Hoax. 
September 15, 2015, Washington, Wired News Agency. Last month, following the August 5th spill of toxic chemicals out of the Gold King Mine near Silverton, Colorado, executives and board members of the Kinross Gold Corporation received letters warning them that their neighborhood water mains had been contaminated with the same mixture of toxic chemicals released in the Colorado spill. The ecological terror group known as the Eco Gorillas claimed responsibility for this act, having signed their name to each of the letters sent to the five executives and five board members. The group claimed the action was as a reward for the company's perceived crimes against the environment. Although police investigations recovered drums containing traces of toxic chemicals near water main accesses, lengthy testing by local and federal officials was unable to detect any of the chemicals in the local water supplies. It appears the group created an elaborate hoax to inconvenience the Kinross leadership and their neighbors, who were evacuated for weeks while the investigation was carried out. Quote, What sort of sick individual would threaten innocent families by claiming to have contaminated their water supply? End quote, said J. Paul Rawlinson, CEO of Kinross. Quote, Our company has one of the best records in environmental safety, and we take spills like the one in Colorado very seriously. We also take seriously the safety of our families and will be attempting to prosecute the individuals responsible for this act of terrorism to the fullest extent of the law. End quote. For their part, the eco gorillas have released a communique that states, in part, quote, We cannot agree more with the Crimes Against Nature awardee, Mr. Rawlinson. What sort of sick individual, indeed, would threaten innocent families by allowing millions of gallons of contaminated water to fester deep underground, only to find its way into the water supply? Kinross, Sunnyside, and myriad other companies, that's who. They have actually done what we only pretended to do, yet we are branded as terrorists? If Kinross had one of the best records in the industry, that record should be submitted as evidence of their trial. End quote. The Eco Gorillas gained notoriety in the destruction of the Glen Canyon Dam in 2011. Three arrests were made in connection with the series of explosions that undermine the dam. One conspirator has continued to elude apprehension and has become a folk hero of the environmental left when she published a recording of this event, which went viral and started a national controversy surrounding eco-terrorism. Headline, EPA involved in another mine spill in Colorado. Eco-radicals threaten former mine owners. October 12, 2015, Denver, Wired News Agency. Just as the spill at the Gold King Mine was beginning to fade from the public's memory, a new EPA-related spill has happened at a Colorado mine. In this case, a contractor working to clean the Superfund site at the abandoned Standard Mine, just outside of Crested Butte, Colorado, caused the leak of 500 to 600 gallons of wastewater. This mine was abandoned in 1974 after 23 years of use, mostly under the management of Standard Uranium Corporation, which became Standard Metals Corporation and was the defendant in many lawsuits related to their abandoned mine properties. Although the EPA won a $30 million decision against the corporation in 2009 and estimates the cleanup will cost over $7.4 million, the remainder of the money is needed to clean up other sites that have not been subsidized by holding the previous owners accountable. Meanwhile, the Gold King Mine, which has been hemorrhaging toxic waste water since August, continues to spill 5 to 600 gallons every minute, releasing heavy metals including zinc, copper, and cadmium into the Animas River. The stakes were raised for the executives of Kinross Gold Corporation following the Gold King spill when a band of domestic terrorists known as the Eco Gorillas claimed to have poisoned the drinking water near their houses. Although it turned out to be a hoax, the executives, their families, and their neighbors were inconvenienced for the multiple week shutdown of their local water systems. The Eco Gorillas have released another statement saying, in part, that, quote, as the news media, bloggers, and elected officials continue to blame the EPA for attempting to clean up the mess, We will call attention to the true culpable parties of these catastrophes, namely the industrialists who rape the land and leave it bleeding toxic chemicals. End quote. The target of the group's threat was not named. End of chapter. End of episode 17 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.